We're going to look at uh, Titus chapter 2 this morning. Uh, Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you that you remind us constantly of your grace throughout the scriptures. I thank you that in this moment uh, that we get to take a moment and, and really think about your grace Lord, it has been lavished upon us. Uh, your love has, has been poured out on us, and we are so grateful for it. Uh, and, and so, Lord, in this time, I, I pray that as we uh, are reminded and experience your grace from, uh, from your scripture, Lord, I pray that you, would, uh, that you would speak to our hearts and that you would remind us that it really is all about you. In Christ's name, amen. It seemed like a great day to go fishing. The sun was out. The skies were blue. The weather was perfect. In the south, the dogwoods were blooming. And when the dogwoods bloom in the south, you go fishing. My brother, he couldn't stand it. He had been cooped up. Uh, inside the house uh, for, for the morning, probably into the afternoon. And if you knew anything about my brother, uh, he is a great fisherman. He can catch fish. I, mean, I really I tell people that if he wanted to do it professionally, he, he could do it. I, you know, when my brother would call me and say, hey, let's go fishing, I knew that we weren't just going to go fishing, we're going to go catch. He's that good. And, and, and so on this particular day, Adam could not stand it anymore. He unlocked the door, walked out onto the carport, pulled the the chalk blocks out from underneath the trailer, climbed in the boat. Our brother was about four. And he started rocking it back and forth, back and forth. Later that afternoon after basketball practice, my dad got a phone call from my mom. And she said, Charlie, I don't want you to panic. Everybody's okay. (laughs) You get those phone calls and you immediately laugh. And and what my mom was doing, she was really prepping my dad for what he was about to see. So we leave the school. This is really before cell phones. We leave the school. We turn on to Timberlane and and, uh, we look. And, And we lived on the small street with really what I would call a ditch across the street. And my brother wanted to go fishing so bad that he got in my dad's boat. Again, he had pulled the chalk blocks out, and he rocked it, and he rocked it, and he rocked it. And before you knew it, he was going. And that boat on the trailer slid right out of the carport, down the driveway, across the road, Cross the grass and right into the ditch. <laughs> my mom, uh, my mom was calling to be a quick extension of grace on behalf of my brother. Because if you knew what my dad was thinking at that point in time, because I was in the truck and we pulled around the corner and he just looks at me and he says, Why is my boat in the ditch? (laughs) Thankfully, my mom had been very gracious. And in that moment, my my brother knew. My brother knew he he had messed up, and he had messed up big time. 
but he needed, he needed an immense amount of grace from not just my mom, but my dad. And so my mom made a decision to try to orchestrate that. And, 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 and God bless her heart. She, she did a great job because from that point forward, we all just kind of laughed about it. It was, you know, nobody was hurt. Adam wasn't hurt. He didn't fall out of the boat. Although he went for a great trip uh, you know, down the drive. You got to think about it. Think about a four-year-old little boy. I think, I think he was about four. Think about a little four-year-old boy in a boat, and he is hauling it down the driveway into the ditch because he wants to go fishing. And so, um, yeah, he, he messed up. It, it, listen, we could, we could tell stories about my brother. He did stuff like that all the time. We, we've, got, we've got stacks of stories of my brother. Um, but we have stacks of story of where we just laughed and we gave grace. In a lot of ways, what I want, want to do this morning, I, I want us to think about that whole concept of grace and that, and then in that really that moment as I was meditating on that story and thinking about the grace that my mom offered and uh, how she, how, how she really, uh, and of course I'm sure she was panicked at one moment, at, at some moment, uh, uh, all mothers would be, most fathers would be, but the grace that was extended to my my brother in that uh, was it was incredible. And, I, and, and, you know, I sat down with Michael this, uh, this, uh, this past uh, week at some point in time. Uh, we were talking about today's service, and he was kind of asking me, picking my brain a little bit about what I'd be preaching on. And I said, you know, Michael, I, I, I want to, I just want to share grace this morning. Uh, because in, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, many of us, not all of us, and I know that no relationship is absolutely perfect, but many of us have experienced the grace of the Lord through our mother. Many of us have extended the grace of Lord to our kids. Some of us in this room are hungry for grace, and we just need to be reminded of it this morning. I went through, I was searching through the scriptures, and um, yeah, I told the, 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 the prayer group this morning that I, that I was looking at probably about six to seven different texts uh, over the course of this week, and, and uh, uh, bless his heart, Bob Roscoe looked at me and uh, asked me, Jason, you did get that narrowed down, didn't you? And of course, I, of course I did, but, but in these texts that I was looking at, um, I, I was just seeing God's grace all over the lives of these incredible women uh, of Scripture who were exercising faith, who were leaning on God, who ultimately were, were, were desperate for Him, that, uh, that were changed by His life. I, I started earlier in the week and I was meditating on, on Hannah uh, from uh, 1 Samuel 1 and how, how she desperately wanted a child and how she uh, wanted, uh, wanted God to give her a child. And God did. And gosh, the, her response was she immediately co uh, committed him to the Lord. And the grace that was upon Samuel's life at that point in time uh, was, was an, an incredible as well. Even from the time where she weaned him, she took him into the temple, and one of the first, first things they did was that they worshiped together. Uh, and, and you go through and you look at this uh, uh, through chapter 1, you see uh, uh, you know, verse 28 uh, that, that uh, uh, she, you know, the, the text is really focused, uh, focused on what Hannah was doing at that point in time. But you see the shift right there at the end of chapter 1, and it says, uh, it, it says that he, meaning Samuel, worshipped the Lord there. It was all because of his mother. Uh, you look through chapter 2 and you see the boy Samuel was ministry to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Uh, verse 21, uh, the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, the boy Samuel continued to grow in the stature and favor with the Lord and also with men. And it all started uh, with, with, with the grace that was poured out upon, upon, Hannah's, uh, upon Hannah's life. I thought about the woman at the well, and we, we, we talked about that passage recently uh, with, with Pastor Tony. And uh, one of the, just the, the grace that she experienced caused her to, she didn't care about her past anymore. She ran into the town and said, y'all got to come meet this man. Uh, that, can, that has told me all about my, my, my life. Uh, you need to meet him. And, 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 and so she basically said, come, come and see. And this whole experience of grace led her to really understand what it means uh, to be redeemed. I thought about the legacy of Timothy's family. And you, and you hear about, a lot, you know, especially when you think about Timothy's family, there's two people that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that come on the radar. Uh, uh, his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. And, and and, and I love how, how Paul, uh, as he's writing to Timothy, he, he, he says that, um, 
He says that I am convinced that your mother Eunice lives in you also. And, and, and what, what did Paul mean by that? Nothing, nothing New World-esque. It was that, that his mother had made such an investment in his life that you got to see that uh, in him. Yeah, I was scanning. This is a whole text that I was, I was really prepping, prepping uh, uh, more so here uh, from Luke chapter 7 and chapter 8. And I thought about doing a, a flyover of what it means to experience the grace of, of forgiveness. Uh, uh, you, in, in chapter 7, incredible story of, of uh, 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 who Luke refers to as a woman of the city. She comes in and she, uh, she anoints Jesus with oil. She is weeping at his feet and takes her hair and scrubs his feet. And, 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 and it upset the religious leaders because uh, uh, they were saying if, if Jesus knew what kind of woman uh, that she was, uh, that... That, that ultimately he would not allow them to or her to touch him. And, and I, love, I love what Jesus, Jesus is just frank. He cuts right through the chase and says, hey, hey, Simon, I have something to say to you. And, and, he, and, and he tells a story and, 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 he, and he, he really honors this woman uh, that, that's at this well. And again, you see this, the, the lavish uh, grace upon this woman the forgiveness that was offered to her. You, you, you keep going down and you look into chapter 8 and there's a, just like the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, there's this list of incredible women that have been, uh, that have been touched by the grace of Christ. They, they ultimately, the, the scripture says that they, they are those who have been healed by him. Spiritually, physically. You drop down in chapter 8 a little bit further, and you, you, you see this woman who had uh, a, a disease who had been hemorrhaging for, for 12 years, and, and, and she was suffering. And, 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 and she hears that Jesus is coming her way, and the language of the New Testament, I, I, I learned this this week, the language of the New Testament isn't about this woman who is... Uh, uh, just barely reaching out to Jesus. The language of the New Testament says that in, in faith, she knew that Jesus could give her all the grace and the healing that, that, that she needed. And, and, and uh, in the language of the New Testament, it's really she grasped him. Uh, and, and Jesus uh, 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 felt power go out of him. And, 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 and he says, you know, who, who touched me? I felt power leave me. And, and he goes and, and, and upends the, the, the social order of the day and, 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 and just really uh, loves this woman and, 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 says, and, and, and says this, go, you're healed, you're, 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 you're forgiven, your faith has made you, you, you well. I kept going um, uh, and, and this is, uh, you're getting kind of into my mind of how I was really prepping to share this morning. Uh, and, and, and I, I couldn't get away from, from Titus 2. And in and, and, and Titus 2, um, uh, Paul uh, begins to teach, uh, to teach Titus exactly what needs to be done and how, how to be a good shepherd. And, and, and in the middle of chapter 2, really more so at the beginning, he talks about uh, older women investing in in, in younger women. And, and, and there's purpose behind it because there's, there's, there's kingdom building that takes place. And, 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 and Paul is saying, I need you to, um, I, I need you to disciple, uh, disciple women. Or I need you to teach the older women to, to disciple women. And, and ultimately, that has everything to do with how the church has to protect the relationship of the family. Uh, because the many parallels of the family and, and marriage has to the church and, and to the scriptures. And I kept reading, and then I, and I came, to, um, came, came to verse 11 here. And I just kind of one of those things where God just fi finally said, okay, you can stop here. Because this is, this, is this is where you're going to go Sunday. And, and, and you, read, re you read this text, and, and in, in the context, really, of, of, of Titus, you see that it really is all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. It's all about uh, God's grace in our life. 
For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Don't, all means all there. All lawlessness. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So there's three things, and, and, and I'm going to clip through them fairly quickly. Uh, quickly this morning, we were laughing about the clock. My wife and I were uh, laughing about the clock. It's kind of flashing, uh, and so it's keeping my, my eyes on the clock this morning. Um, <laughs> and, and, so, um, and so what I want to do, there's really three things out of this text I want us to, uh, uh, to, to get from, uh, from, from, this, from this scripture. One, and I've already said it, it's all about the grace of Jesus. It's all about the grace of, of God that has appeared there in verse 11. What is grace? Uh, what, 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 what is grace? And that sometimes when we stop and we think about it, we, we, want, to, uh, we want to spin it. We want to maybe put our own, own uh, 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 thoughts about it. But really, uh, it's about what the Lord has done. Uh, some of you may, may have already heard me. If you were here at the trailhead uh, uh, several Wednesday nights ago, and, uh, um, uh, and we were talking about grace, I, I, I used this quote. And so forgive me if this is redundant for you, but I can't, I can't define grace any better than this. Uh, and, and, and so I want you to, I want you to hear uh, these words from uh, uh, Tulian uh, Shavidjan, uh, who is uh, Billy Graham's grandson. He's a pastor in Florida, and uh, he wrote a book called One Way Love. Uh, and that's one of the books I've been reading lately and kind of meditating on. And in the beginning of that book, he, he defines Christ for us. And so instead of me trying to define it, I'm going to let somebody else define it, and I'm going to share it with you. I love, I love reading things and then passing them on, on, on uh, uh, back to you. Um, uh, and actually, uh, uh, Tulian is quoting someone else in, 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 this, uh, in this portion of the book. It's, it says this, What is grace? The definition for this book comes from Paul Zoll. He writes, Grace is love that seeks you out when you have nothing to give in return. Grace is love coming at you that has nothing to do with you. Grace is being loved when you are unlovable. The cliché definition of grace is unconditional love. It is a true cliché, for it is a good description of the thing. Let's go a little further, though. Grace is a love that has nothing to do with you, the beloved. It has everything and only to do with the lover. Grace is irrational in the sense that it has nothing to do with weights and measures. It has nothing to do with my intrinsic qualities or so-called gifts, whatever they may be. It reflects a decision on the part of the giver, the one who loves, in relation to the receiver, the one who is loved, that negates any qualification the receiver may personally hold. Grace is one way. Grace doesn't make demands. It just gives. And from our vantage point, it always, I love this part, and from our vantage point, it always gives to the wrong person. That's exactly what Jesus was, his point was when he looked at Simon and said, I've got something to say to you. Grace doesn't make demands, it just gives. We see this over and over again in the Gospels. Jesus is always giving grace to the wrong people, prostitutes, tax collectors, half-breeds. The most extravagant sinners of Jesus' day received his most, most compassionate welcome. He refuses to play it safe and lay it up. Grace is recklessly generous, uncomfortably promiscuous. It doesn't use sticks. I love this part too. It doesn't use sticks, carrots, or time cards. It doesn't keep score. As Robert Kappen puts it, grace works without requiring anything on our part. It's not expensive. 
It's not even cheap, it's free. It refuses to be controlled by our innate sense of fairness, reciprocity, or even, and even, and even handedness. It defies logic. It has nothing to do with earning, merit, or deservedness. It is opposed to what is owed. It doesn't expect a return on investments. It is a liberating contradiction between what we deserve and what we get. Grace is unconditional acceptance given to an undeserving person by an obligated, unobligated giver. And so in a lot of ways, when you hear that definition of grace, point one still, it's all about Jesus and his grace that he's given you and me. This is, this is exactly Paul's point. And, and, and we're getting into... ...makes us right before God. For, for, through, when, where God makes us right before him through his son, Christ. This is exactly what Paul was getting at in Ephesians 2, where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that nobody, nobody can boast. You think about this in, in, in the greater context of even Ephesians. What Paul is trying to do is, especially in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, he's trying to say, Christian, look at what God has done for you. This is about his grace in your life and you can't do anything to make it better you can't increase it this is something he is uh, again the language paul uses lavish upon you with all wisdom and insight making known to you the mystery of his will what an incredible incredible verse there and and, and so when, when we when we think about this, this passage in, in, in Titus 2, and you, and you see that, that uh, you, you see this grouping of relationships and what needs to take, in these, uh, take place in these relationships, it all takes place because, because of verse 11. It's all because of the grace of God. And it's all because it, he, he, he's brought his salvation to, to, to all men. Micah. Oh, and I, I, I copied this because I, I was meditating on this late last night um, and, and just talking about the compassion. Again, you go back and you look at those, those examples that I was reading through earlier and you, and you see the compassion of God and his grace in, their, in, the, in these individuals' lives. And that's what the writers wanted us to grasp. And, 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 and you think about God's love and his compassion. And I was reading uh, Micah uh, 7, uh, verses 18 through 20. It says this, who is a God like you, pardoning inequity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever. He, I'm sorry, because, listen, look at where God's delight is. You want to know where God's delight is? Micah clears it up for us. Because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham, as you swore to your fathers from the days of old. And so again, in this text, and, and literally, you could, you, could, you could take this one verse and spend weeks on it. Um, because in, in this... It, it, it is all about for the grace of God has brought salvation to you and to me. And, and our response is that we should swell up and say, God, thanks for that. I, I, I don't deserve it. Ooh, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> has, have you ever, has it ever happened to you? Has it ever happened uh, at, at a point in your life where, where you, you, you were able to be the recipient of grace that was completely undeserved. Maybe, maybe you could have been 
thrown out on your ear. Maybe, maybe you said something that, um, um, quite frankly, wasn't appropriate. Uh, maybe, maybe you, um, maybe you accidentally did something, and and instead of somebody coming down hard on you, you got grace. It happened uh, in our family, and I don't want to go into a lot of details, but it's something happened in our family where, um, in, in, our, in our greater family that happened, and uh, there was an incident that took place, and it was wrong. It was, it was, a, it was a violation of the rules. Boundary, a boundary was crossed. And, and I was left, we were left, a, a lot of us were left, like, how, how do we want to handle this? And I looked at a particular individual, and, and, I, and, I, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, y you know what I want to happen through this? I want my family member to know that when he messes up, it's okay. Because I mess up too. And I need grace. And the guy looked at me and said, we'll go that route. And, 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 and so I, I really... What I want to do, I want you to ask that question. When, when, when you mess up, what kind of, what level of grace do you want? When, when somebody else messes up, what level of grace do you want to give them? Because in, in the greater context of the scriptures, and I don't have time to run through a quick theology of Romans, but, but when, you, when, you get, when you get into Romans 5, and, and, and you hear that Christ died for me even while I still sinned, I def again, to that quote, it defies all logic. And, 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 and so, what, what I trying to grab this and run it to the ground because I want you to get it. It's, it really is all about the grace of God that has appeared to us in these days. This first thing, second thing, verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 12. Grace teaches us. And in, in a lot of ways, grace does not nullify our need to do the right thing. Grace does not nullify our need to do the right thing. Um, verse, verse 12 says this. It teaches us to say no. What is it referring to? Well, the grace of God. And ultimately, that's personified in Christ. But specifically in this, in this, in this text, it's, the, it, the it is, is the grace of God. The grace of God teaches, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And, and, and so this is exactly, again, I wish I had time to unpack another portion of Romans for you. Uh, but, but this is exactly what Paul was dealing with when, 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 when you see, uh, again in Romans 5, how through one man's disobedience, sin entered the world. Through another man's disobedience, namely Christ, forgiveness and grace did. Uh, and, and so in Romans 5, uh, Paul writes, For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And let's talk about Adam. And so by one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And this is all talking about justification here. This is, this is, this is talking about where, where, where God is making us right before him. The law of Jesus, not of anything that we've done, and so the, the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, I love this, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also may reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What in the world does that all mean? Well, listen, you and I still... We still sin. I still wrestle with sin. I, I don't know about you, but I, I still sin. Uh, I
spirit that lives within me that is renewing me day by day. Did you know that ever since that uh, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden um, uh, back in Genesis 3, he has been about renewing his image in you and me every single day. And that is, listen, that is a process that, 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 that takes place. It, it can't uh, happen on, uh, on, uh, on its own. Uh, and, uh, you know, I said this this past uh, Wednesday night. Just when I think I've learned something, it's almost as if it, uh, sin uh, uh, wiggles back to life. There's a great illustration. If you've never read this book, you should. Uh, it's kind of on this uh, top ten list. Uh, 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 one of my favorite professors, Dr. Guthrie, uh, recommended it in one of the classes I took years ago, and I still go back and read it over and over and over again. It's What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. And in that book, he gives this illustration of how... how we're, we're putting sin to death, and, and, and we'll constantly be putting sin to death in, in, in our lives. But he gives this illustration about uh, this, this biologist. And in this, this biologist, he, uh, he writes, he says, performed a rather bizarre experiment. He did it on, uh, on, uh, on, on ants. And so he took this, um, took this group of ants, and after noticing that it took a few days to recognize that one of their crumpled nest mates had died, he determined that the ants identified death by clues of smell, not visually. Now, as the ant's body began to decompose, it would put off this smell, and other ants would come up and would carry the ant out. And so like any little boy, mischievous little boy, what's up? let's try this. What's the smell? And so he was trying to figure out the smell, and he came up with this particular acid. And, and, so, uh, and, and so he, he, he put that acid on a living ant. And you know what happened? The other ants smelt it, and they, uh, they, they came, and they lifted up this living ant and took him off to the ant graveyard and dropped him and left him there for dead. But he wasn't dead. He just smelled dead. Every little boy probably is thinking right now, and, I, and I'm thinking, how in the world can I figure out that, that, uh, that acid because I want to try that at home. And so he goes back, and, and he's talking about this image. And he says this, and, he, and, he, and it goes back to even, somebody flipping here, it even goes back to this whole uh, uh, portrait in... Uh, 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 Romans 6, let me get there. Because, remember, I, I read from you verse, uh, in chapter 5, for where sin increased, grace increased. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Original English, absolutely not. It's no, absolutely not. And, and, and so when he, he says when he thinks of this image, dead ants acting very much alive, when he reads Romans 6, sin may be dead, but it stubbornly, stubbornly wiggles back to life. And, 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 and so you, you get back to this, the, the, the passage that we were looking at, and you, you hear all this grace, and it is all about what God has done in our lives. But in the end, we, we have a certain responsibility to, to one another. And that's that, that's that horizontal nature, uh, that horizontal relationship that, that, God has, uh, that God has called us to. So when you read, again, the grace of God has brought salvation, and then you, you see where it has trained us, that word there in the original is uh, pedea, where we, where we get uh, um, uh, the, the, the word pedagogy. And I've been studying that word uh, kind of as a word study recently in multiple passages. Um, uh, it's the same word where, where, where God is using all of this, this, his grace. He's actually using it to teach us, to train us, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Because ultimately, when we look at the grace of God, we see, we, we see the author and the perfecter of our faith, and that teaches us how to live in our relationships on, uh, on, on this earth. Does that make sense? Yes? I got one yes.
Here's a, another note that let me flesh it out a little bit more. Are we to treat sin seriously? Absolutely. Uh, do we want to take off the old man and put on the new man? Absolutely. That's what, what Paul calls us to do in, 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 in Ephesians. But I love what Piper says, and he's discussing the Lord's Supper here. Uh, and this is something I had a while back that I, that I hate that I didn't get a chance to share. Um, but, but he talks about us not being paralyzed by the guilt of our sin. Why? Because the grace of God has already appeared to us. We're already right before God. We, we, we're going to mess up, but we're already made right before God. So when I, when I stand before God, and if I die right now, if there's any unconfessed sin in my life, that's not going to keep me out of heaven because I've already been made right with God. Do we still want to confess our sins? Yeah, absolutely. We want to confess them one to another. And, 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 and we, want, we want the forgiveness of Christ to, to, to reign in our life. And, and, and so when, when Piper is talking about the sin not paralyzing you and me, um, uh, he, he is talking about, um, uh, again, experiencing his grace. And, and Piper, and these are two notes that I kind of walked away with when I, when I read this, uh, because he was, he was talking about uh, the, the, the whole process of examination in, in our lives. Um, he says this, that in this particular moment, the most important thing that we can do in our relationship to others because of, and I'm paraphrasing here, because of our relationship with God is to confess it. Confess it right there. Again, it's not because we are trying to get made right before God again. It is because we are trying to live lives that reflect His image being renewed in us. Last thing um, uh, this, this, this morning, um, uh, again, back, back at Titus, it says this. And I, I don't really have, uh, really don't have the time to, to unpack this completely. But there is a, a spiritual overarching uh, principle here in verse 13. While we wait, again, he, he's, he, we're being trained by the grace of God. The grace of God is the very thing that's teaching us to say no to ungodliness and the passions of this world. The grace of God is the very thing that's teaching us to live self-controlled lives. While we wait, verse 13, for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And so the final thing is that grace keeps us focused on the life to come. Grace keeps us focused on the life that is to come. Because guess what? It even goes back to point one. It's all about Jesus and all about his, his work. And the reality is, is that, that, I, that that whole life to come, that, that's something I, I'm not preparing my own house in heaven. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be with me also. In that, in that vein, um, it, it really, and I, and I hope that I'm not, I hope I can transition this well enough. Because of that focus that is, um, uh, that, that is, um, that it should be, that should be on the life to come. This is what John was talking about here in 1 John 2. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and what he does comes not from the Father but from the world. The world, and this is where I want you to get it, the world, this world, and its desires are passing away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. And so how can, we be, how can we be found in that? Well, again, it's all about grace. It's all about being in the grace of God that has appeared to, to all men.
Now, some of you are asking the question, uh, uh, Jason, this is all good. Does this have any application to, to Mother's Day? And I would say absolutely. It has everything to do with, 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 with Mother's Day. Because in the con- greater context of this passage, you see Paul calling to Titus and saying, will you, will you train the older women to teach the younger women? And if you were going to ask the question, what, what should you teach? Yeah, there's some very specifics there. But in the greater context is verse 11 through 14 that we just, just read. And, 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 so, uh, and so I don't know about you, but, but, but we all need grace. We, 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 all, we all need grace. Uh, I, you know, there's, there, there, there are those here um, who, um, who in a lot of ways, are, they are so thankful uh, for the joy. I'm so thankful for the relationship I've had in, uh, in the past and have with my mother now. I'm thankful that uh, in a lot of ways she was able to teach me some of these things. That She was able to teach me about grace. I, I, I know that there are some here that, uh, that long to, to be able to pick up the phone and to call their mother. And uh, uh, and, 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 and so in a lot of ways, there is that, that hope, that deferred hope that God leaves us in this passage, that, that day that is, that which is to come. Uh, I know there are some uh, that are uh, wrestling through the adoption process. And there is a delayed hope there even. Uh, but uh, I want to encourage you to, to operate in that whole grace of God as you are seeking to do the very same thing uh, to... Uh, to lavish your love uh, upon, upon somebody else, just like we have been adopted into, uh, in, into God's family. There are some here that, uh, and, uh, that, that aren't able to, to, to have kids, and they so long for, for that. Uh, but but the, uh, in, in this passage, we, we see that, that God's grace trumps that even. And, 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 you, and that's why I started even with Hannah. Uh, because in desperation, she knew that the only uh, the only thing that she could really do is to cry out in desperation for the for the grace of the Lord. And so, I just want to encourage you this morning. I and mean, there are multiple other levels there, and I, I realize that that I, I haven't hit on every single one of those. Uh, but uh, I, it's kind of one of those things where we live in a in, in a day where um, uh, uh, where. Uh, social media does not reflect uh, uh, everything that's going on in our hearts because the reality is is that, I don't know about you, but when I post things on social media, I'm usually posting the joyful things. Uh, I'm usually posting the things that I'm really excited about, and I'm not posting the things that, uh, that, 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 that are difficult and that need uh, the extension of, of, of the grace of the Lord. And so in, in this moment, uh, we're going to come and we're going to pray here and we'll let the, the, the band come and uh, lead us in, in worship. Uh, here's what I'd like you to do. There'll be staff members here at the front. Some of you may want to come and pray and uh, 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 just utilize the, 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 the altar here. Some of you may uh, want to uh, cry out in desperation to the Lord and uh, some of you may want to cry out to the Lord and say thank you for what you're doing in my life. Some of you have, you, you have not thanked the Lord for uh, his grace in your life in quite some time and you just want to stop and then say before you take another step in this day of worship uh, you just want to stop and you want to say God thank you. you you've been gracious to me, um, uh, whatever it may be, uh, I'm, I'm going to pray. The altar will open up. There'll be staff members here at the front uh, for for you. If you uh, if you are in this room and you have no clue about about grace and God's grace and what it means uh, to to uh, to lean on Him uh, to uh, to let Him. Uh, be your salvation, to let him be your, your, uh, the, the one who paid the penalty for your sin, the one that gives eternal life. I want to encourage you. Uh, that, that every one of these staff members that will be here at the front, they can show you what that means further. And so let me pray and that we'll, and we'll continue to worship in song. Lord, thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I know that uh, uh, on this day, uh, uh, we want to say thanks for your grace. We look back on our lives and we see some incredible things that you've done. Uh, Lord, we, 
Uh, we, we, we look back, and, and, and Lord, I know that for many of us, not everything is, uh, has worked out the way that we had expected it to. And so, Lord, we, we continue to call out in grace uh, for your grace upon us. We, we thank you for the salvation that you've given us, and we thank you that, that you are, are working and that there will be a day where we will, uh, where we will be with you. Uh, Jesus, thank you for going and preparing a place for us. And, and so in this time, uh, Jesus, I would ask that you would, that you would minister to our hearts and that you would meet each person where they're at, uh, knowing that we're at, at different points in, uh, uh, in our walks and in our lives. Lord, Lord I pray that we would, that we would ultimately uh, be celebratory of you and that uh, knowing that even in those difficult times that, uh, uh, that you would uh, instill in us the, uh, the attitude of Job uh, that, uh, that when you have tested us, that we should come forth as gold. And so that's my prayer for us, that you would continue to test us, that you would continue to teach us, and that you would continue to mold us by your grace and for your honor, for your namesake, for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.